How would you describe your growth? Take a second to think back on what you were like when you were 13 years old. Now come back to this moment. I bet a lot of us are a far cry from where we were when we were 13 for a variety of different reasons. You've developed social and political preferences, had life-changing relationships, you've, uh, you've had life-changing relationships. So how do we reflect on that growth? How do we describe it unless we can reflect on that journey and the detours we've taken along the way? William Walton does just that in his composition, The Three Songs from Edith Sitwell. He embraces his shift from early experimentalism to his later self-definition as a neo-romantic composer. Three Songs from Edith Sitwell is based on the Facade Entertainment, a collaboration he wrote with the Sitwell sibling trio in 1923 that was an avant-garde mashup of rhythm-based poetry and modern music. Three Songs from Edith Sitwell the last two pieces of it, Old Sir Falk and Through Gilded Trellises, take directly from Facade, the entertainment. They take direct musical elements. So harmony, rhythm, rhythm, fragmented melody, and the poetry. The first piece of the set, however, Daphne, takes from two later pieces of his, the Viola Concerto of 1929 and Belshazzar's Feast of 1931. Daphne showcases his later, more lyrical aspects of musical development, from harmony and lyrical melody to the narrative that he uses. All of this leads to his arrival on the international world stage with Symphony No. 1 in 1934 that truly identifies him as a neo-romantic composer, competitive with those in France, Germany, England, Italy. So, because he reflected on this growth in Three Songs from Edith Sitwell, we now have the bridge from his experimentalism to his neo-romanticism. And we can do the same thing for ourselves. What, is, what are our bridges? How do we reflect on our growth to see where we are now and who we are today? Thanks. <laughs> Good morning. So I'm going to start by making an assumption. And I'm going to make an assumption that this is a one-to-one -one learning environment. Because we have got access to wireless internet. My guess is also that you have got a technology device with you today, uh, maybe a laptop or a tablet. So that is just one example of how prolific technology has become in our everyday lives. But it's also become very prolific in classrooms. Um, but one of the problems that we face when we train teachers is that the set of skills that you need to be an effective technology user as a teacher are not the same set of skills that you need to use technology well in your personal life. And what's more is that as I began to spend time watching teachers in one-to-one -one technology learning environments, I saw them doing really powerful things with their students with that technology ratio. In fact, even in one historically underperforming school, I saw kids solving problems and answering questions that was well beyond what the curriculum was asking those students to do. And so I wanted to ask this question through research. What is it that those teachers are doing in their classrooms that we can prepare other teachers to do? And so I answered that question by assembling a panel of experts from across the country, researchers, practitioners, administrators, and I supported them to develop a consensus to the answer to that question. And what that panel has developed is a list of 30 teaching competencies that are organized into these five categories. And so, for example, one of the things that our panel told us is that it's about the delivery of the lesson. It's about a teacher being able to capitalize on the teachable moment with her student. And so when that teacher finds something online, that teacher needs to be able to help that student evaluate that, but not just that, be able to take it and use it to solve a problem or do something really meaningful. And so that is where this Research is different. It's not just about publishing these results and moving on, but using this competency list as a tool for teachers to be able to say, where am I now? How do I want to develop my skills and improve? 
It's also a tool for teacher preparation programs like the one here at Towson, so that we can begin to ask ourselves whether we are actually preparing our next year's teachers for these kinds of realities. Because ultimately, this has never been about the technology that the student has had in front of them. It is about the combination of a really skilled teacher and that technology who helps her students to do something really meaningful with it. Thank you. Let me shed some light on the problem I've been looking at. Uh, Oftentimes, as a software engineer, I'm tasked with trying to provide a program to a customer. Now, how do I know what the customer wants? I have to ask them questions, obviously. Then they can say stuff like, I want, this I want this program compatible with Linux, or I want it to be easily upgradable. Now, how do I keep a record of that? I can't simply memorize it, because oftentimes they have pages, tens of pages, hundreds of pages of requirements, so I have to write it down. The issue, I, the issue that we run into is that oftentimes, People, the, the customer can have different requirements at different points. They can be similar, but they can also be different. So how do I actually make this document readable, easy for me to understand, and how do I then make a program from that? Well, if the customer has a small project, it's easy. I can do it in a page or two. I can manually look at it. If the customer has a large project, it can be hundreds of pages. So we can use a software solution, or I'm looking into using a software solution called Topic Modeling, which allows me to basically find all the topics that the requirements are in, and I'm able to then parse it into certain categories, and then from there, I'm potentially able to make sentences from that. <clears throat> so, how do we take all these words, these sentences, the things that, the, that are at the top of my slide, uh, and create a single document that will outline that exactly? Um, well, we use topic modeling, that unlabeled uh, funnel in the middle of my slide. Uh, this basically uh, looks through the words and sentences to try to find the hinted, hidden language uh, structures that are found within, um, within our language. Uh, for example, if I input, if I put in like a newspaper into topic modeling, it could maybe give out a category of finance and a category of sports. And in the finance category, there might be stuff like interest rate or Dow Jones Industrial. And in sports, it might be basketball and cricket. <coughs> Now, and then within those categories, there could be, uh, uh, oh, sorry. <clears throat> uh, these clusters of similar words can give us a topic of the document, or essentially a model of the topic of the, of the document, hence topic modeling. Now, you're prob probably wondering where the gears are that work this in. One is called machine learning. The other one is called natural language processing. Machine learning is a way for a computer system to learn easily once it's given a little bit of training data. And the idea is that once you give the data, it's, it goes on its own and is able to solve the, solve the problem. Natural language processing is a way for the computer system to uh, decipher language in the same way that we would um, decipher language. So my hope is that if we apply topic modeling to this requirements document, we can make it easier to read, easier to understand, and we one step closer to fulfilling the customer's solution. Thank you. We the people. We the people are the first three words in the preamble to our Constitution. And really, this is the big picture research. This is the frame that I used to explore how to engage those who typically are not part of we the people. And this research is really important because we know that a civic engagement gap exists. We know that urban youth tend to lose out on the skills, dispositions, resources, and really opportunities needed to fully engage in our society. And most recently, I think the Parkland, Florida students can illustrate this gap. They have been able to so motivate and move our country and, co and companies to make great change. And urban youth often lack that opportunity to have their voices heard in the very same ways. So as an educator who has focused on urban education and technology for over 20 years, I was interested in ways that technology can help bridge the civic engagement gap. 
and I focused on community technology centers. Community technology centers are places located usually in low-income neighborhoods that have, that have helped bridge a variety of divides for nearly 30 years. And so I was interested in how these centers could also help bridge the civic engagement divide. I selected two centers located in a mid-Atlantic city, and between those two centers I had seven participants who were part of my qualitative multi-site, multi-case study. Over 30 hours I spent with these young people, learning about the things that they did with technology in these centers. And what I found is that the products they made allowed them to develop the very skills and dispositions needed in order to engage fully into society. I used the positive technological development framework, which really helped me understand how these young people used their technology. And what I found is through their 3D printed items, their websites, their um, animated videos, their photography, their videos. I found that through those content creations, they developed skills such as communication, collaboration, community building, and they developed civic engagement identities. The literature tells us that these are the very skills that they need in order to participate in fully life. And so really my research helped establish community technology centers as viable places where urban youth can develop these skills and help bridge the digital divide when it comes to engagement. My hope is that as a nation, we can spend more time investing in urban youth and, and all youth, of course, but urban youth specifically, so that we can actually become a more perfect nation through truly we the people. And going on a walk will bringing awareness also bring more understanding and connection to communities. Before I get to that, I'd like to try a quick experiment. If you would, everyone fold their hands together. Good. Just notice how this feels. What hand is in front of the other? That's your habit. And now let's switch the order of our hands. How does that feel different? As humans, we're really great at establishing habits for ourselves. We do this as a way to simplify our lives so our minds have less things that we need to actively think about. For example, when I was drawing this slide, it would have been really difficult if all I could concentrate on was how to hold a pen. But sometimes these habits can lock us into really rigid patterns of behavior. I'm not just talking about smoking or drinking too much, but the habits that we develop in our interactions with other people and places. For example, I drive my car to work every day, and sometimes I'm driving and I don't even notice it, and I'm at work. These types of habits can really close us out to a range of experiences, so much so that we're unaware of what we're doing or how we're feeling. Mindfulness is a way to take a closer look at these experiences so we can begin to understand how our everyday interactions are affecting us. Mindfulness is taking a closer look at what is happening around or within you without judgment, like we just did with our hands a moment ago. In my research, I take this concept of mindfulness to create self-guided walks that challenge people's habits when they're moving through their everyday spaces. I do this as a way to learn about how people are moving through space, but also to provide people with a tool to examine their own communities. Um, walking is really good at this aim because it can help clarify the mind and it slows the pace of life down so we're able to pay attention. Every walk is vastly different because people are bringing a variety of experiences and backgrounds. So as a result, each walk begins to foster a, a sense of accepting things as they are and it can help provide better understanding of ourselves, our communities, and the spaces that we inhabit. Thank you. So if I can step out on a limb here, I imagine a lot of us when we go home today are going to watch the news. And it's not going to take long for you to see a story that you find morally wrong. Um, the question is, is why do you feel morally wrong? And how long did it take you to make that decision? See, we used to think we, we made this judgment as a rational judge. We weigh out all our options carefully and we make a calculated decision. However, now we understand that we act more like motivated lawyers. 
We start at our assumption and we argue our case based on that. Um, and with that, with being a motivated lawyer comes an important um, physiological process of emotion. We all have emotions. Um, so if you want to think about when you're watching the news, you have a gut response when you see something wrong. It's not, you're not a philosopher thinking top down, it's a bottom up. So the question is, why? We're not entirely sure, but research suggests that emotion signals one important thing, harm. If you want to think about it this way, um, we have harm glasses that we always have on and it, and it shapes how we see the world. I mean, it, it helps humans survive for a long time. You think something's harmful, you stay away. So research has looked at one emotion so far of disgust. They looked at disgust, saying when you feel disgusted, you also find something harmful. But we have lots of other emotions other than disgust. We have anger, compassion, anxiety, and that's what my research looked at. I looked at other emotions and see if, if harm is involved in that process, and it turns out it is. So what that means is, if I find something harmful, I have a gut bottom-up response. I have strong emotions, and therefore I find it morally wrong. So the question is, um, why does this matter? <laughs> it sounds purely theoretical, um, but I would argue it's not. I would argue that these motivated lawyer bottom-up processes are important for us. They're important for both how we work amongst ourselves and how we think um, uh, about ourselves and how we interact with each other. Think about this. Think about politics. Think about racial bias or stereotyping. Think about how people cope with trauma. Are people acting like rational judges in that case? I would argue no. They act like motivated lawyers who can't take off their harm glasses. They always see harm when it's not there. So what's the solution? My research says reassess your emotions. Say, this is not harmful. This person is not harmful, even though I might be feeling that this is the case. And I think if we can do that, we can uh, bridge the partisan political gap, we can bridge racial relations, and we can help people cope better with trauma amongst a whole other slew of things that will help us live happier and more peaceful lives. Thank you. All right, let me tell you a story about a cup of coffee. Not long ago, my in-laws were visiting me and my mother-in-law wanted to make a pot of coffee. So I pointed her to my Mr. Coffee Maker in the kitchen. She took the pot, filled it up with water, put it on the warming plate and said, now what? Um, I had to stop myself from laughing, um, and then I realized she'd never used a drip coffee maker before. She had a percolator at home, so it was understandable she couldn't use it. A few weeks ago, I was visiting my in-laws with my children, and I was the first one awake and suddenly realized I had no idea how to use a percolator. <laughs> um, my sister-in-law across the street had a new super fancy Keurig that was so complicated I was scared to use it. So I ended up with no coffee that day, which was not fun visiting my in-laws. Um, <laughs> this relates to my dissertation study because I was looking at how um, teachers learn about technology and wanting to understand that process. And so I looked at how they, um, how they prefer to teach their students the different methods and how innovative they currently were with technology. And what I found out is that first, it's important to know if they're percolator teachers, Mr. Coffee teachers, or Keurig teachers because their innovativeness affects how they like to learn about technology. So in my study, I did a survey to determine this, and then I discovered that their learning needs differed. So what, um, for example, a percolator teacher and a Keurig teacher would learn about the latest coffee gadget in very different ways. And the Mr. Coffee teacher would likely need different information as well. So from this, I believed that, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, from this, I learned that knowing the innovativeness of the teacher is vital when we're planning learning for them. I'd like to tell you another story about a teacher named Melissa. She was a percolator teacher and she felt that technology did not add anything to her middle school music classes. It distracted. And 
She also thought it was a waste of her time to learn about new technologies. So she avoided it. She did not enjoy her learning experiences until she was introduced to a new tool that was specifically for music and that was perfect for her middle school age students. She told me that it was the equivalent of, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. That's all right. Uh, um, she told me that um, it absolutely 1,000% changed her ability to teach her students and um, went, f which I considered going from, to go back to the coffee metaphor, a regular cup of coffee to a venti mocha cappuccino with whipped cream. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>